Ladies and gentlemen, Neil is sick with COVID right now and he's struggling. Um, I mean, like really extremely sick to the point where he, when he last spoke with me, he did not sound very well. So let's hope he recovers. We're going to be discussing, is Christianity a mystery religion? A presentation will be today by Derek Bennett. And I hope that everybody watching will like it, comment, drop your comments, drop your likes, and do us a favor Check out Derek's YouTube channel. Go subscribe to his, his channel. Show him support. Let the algorithm gods see that so they can come and boost this channel and get him more, I guess you say, visual, um, getting him brought in front of more people. He does a lot of uh, anti-apologetic work, but also just getting into the content. You want to know what's being said? Check him out, and you're going to really enjoy today's episode. So subscribe to Atheologica. I'm putting that in the chat. And if the mods in this chat could be so kind as to recycle this for Neil, um, just so that people can, you know, he likes to promote his guests just like I do. Also, um, Derek Bennett has a, a Patreon. Go support him because this presentation today is downloadable, accessible for you if you go and support him. And you can support him for any cost, whatever you're able to afford. Uh, Derek Bennett has the access for you. Become a patron of his, if not for the very least, to get true salvation, not the fake stuff that you know you hear all these people talk about all the time. I mean, he's the only one who offers the real stuff. Other than Gnostic Forma and other than Myth Vision and other than uh, – we're all like fused as one. We're you know, Anyway, also subscribe or become Neil's patron if you like the work he's doing and the hard work he puts into this, the scholarship he's constantly doing, help support him. Neil's a friend of mine. And um, – when I met him in Israel, we clicked. It was like, all right, bro, let's make it happen, Captain. So I ask that everybody today keep in mind, if you super chat, you're helping out Neil. Neil could use it. Give the Christmas spirit, help out, ask your questions of Derek, tell him how bad his haircut looks or how good it looks. Yeah, you know. Um, but seriously, go help him out. Um, I can't ask you enough. I usually a plug for my own channel, but I will bend over backwards for other people to really emphasize. I know how hard he works. He helps me out with editing things as well. And I rely on Neil in many ways to get the stuff done. So please, uh, for the very least help out. So now to our intro, everybody in the chat, welcome. I suppose I'm taking it. Hey, welcome back. You are about to attain true gnosis with Gnostic informant. And uh, of course, it's Derek Lambert here filling in for him because he is sick. Again, he's sick. But maybe Asclepius, as our friend in the chat here, Jason Sobek, is mentioning, Asclepius can probably help him out with that. Not so sure Jesus could, but I'm pretty confident in Asclepius. Welcome back, Derek Bennett. I know you're dead and still walking here after the long presentation on Myth Vision. Do you have anything to say before we end up entering into the presentation? I just want to say that I think my haircut looks really good. And, and what you said was hurtful. And I'm going to hold a grudge about that. So, what? uh, <laughs> what he's foolish. I can't say that. On camera. <laughs> <laughs> All right, look, um, Elf on a Shelf has positive things to say about your haircut, Derek, and um, sh shut up. Um, let's get into the presentation when you're ready, my friend. Let's do it, guys. We're going to discuss the crossroads between Christianity and the mystery religions and attempt to answer the question, is Christianity a mystery religion? 
I can't so wait. uh pop pop that slide pop it pop Come it on, like it's pop hot it on up here we go all right pop i'm like gonna open hot. my phone because i cannot see both screens i'm gonna um stay unmuted in case something happens again but i won't talk sure. and uh i'll start yeah please don't talk God. <laughs> again again repeating if you hear something and it tingles your ears and you need to ask a question, ask it now. No worries. I'll scroll back. We'll get through. We already have one super chat that I saw when we first started. Thank you. Um, I will go through your questions and we will answer your questions or even criticisms, whatever it might be. This goes to Neil and helps him out. So please do. Here we go. So, of course, beginning with the first slide, is Christianity a mystery religion? Go ahead and pop into that next slide. So, brief history, uh, history lesson uh, discussing the agricultural revolution. About 12,000 years ago, the last ice age came to an end, resulting in the northward migration of wild game that hunter-gatherers had depended upon since time immemorial. In response, man came to settle along the banks of seas and rivers where they took up fishing and agriculture in order to maintain sustenance. As agriculture became an essential function of both civilization and sustenance, it also became crucial to understand the nature of the seasons and the solar cycles that contribute to seasonal change. Since the scientific method had yet to be conceived, we came to understand the sun and the seasons through ritual and myth, particularly the personification of crop life. From this sprang various myths about dying, rising gods, which symbolized the death and return of vegetation, the waxing and waning of the sun, etc. So these were personifications of natural processes. Over time, man came to believe that performing certain rituals of initiation could mystically unite him with the fate of the risen God, affecting for him a spiritual rebirth in this life and ultimately a blessed existence in the next. So that is a very sort of um, brief synopsis of the history of the mysteries. Uh, just a snapshot. And we're going to delve right into this and get into all the gory details. We can go on to the next, the next slide here. The Egyptian mortuary cult of Osiris. Uh, Osiris was the Egyptian god of seasonal renewal and agriculture, along with sacred kingship, mummification, and resurrection. The pharaoh was believed to bodily rise and ascend to heaven as Osiris had done, having been justified and vindicated against sin and death. Over time, the process was democratized so that every ancient Egyptian could become identified with Osiris in death and raised to new life in the afterworld as a newly reborn god. I'm going to cut in here real quick and say that if you are joining us from the previous presentation, note that you're going to see a good deal of overlap here between this show and the one we just held on Myth Vision. But do stick around because you're also going to see a lot of material here that is uh, that you're going to learn from that you, you didn't witness uh, in the previous presentation. So stick around. From the Pyramid Texts. Uh, may you arise, O king, protected and provided as a god, equipped with the form of Osiris upon the throne of the foremost of the Westerners. Horus comes to you, O king, that he may do for you what he did for his father Osiris, so that you may live as those who are in the sky live. Raise yourself because of your strength. May you ascend to the sky. May you have power in your body. Rise up to life for you have not died. Raise yourself upon your left side. Put yourself upon your right side. Receive these dignities of yours, which your father Jeb has given you from the coffin text. So here uh, the initiate, whether the, the king or uh, just a commoner who was able to afford the basic necessities of burial and mummification is being equated with Osiris so that they too, having died, will rise to new life, uh, and in some instances, even, some instances even rise to the skies, to the heavens. Next slide, then, uh, continuing with the Egyptian mortuary cult of Osiris, 
Uh, this is from actual Egyptologists. Uh, just as Osiris was killed and rose to new life, so the dead king identified with Osiris through the recitation of the spell is made alive again. In other words, what we have here is the bodily resurrection of the dead king from Egyptologist Louis Zakbar. Osiris provided a model whereby the effects of the rupture caused by death could be totally reversed through the mummification rites, which incorporated an assessment of the deceased's character, the Egyptians hoped to be revived and justified like Osiris, Egyptologist Mark J. Smith. The identification of the dead with Osiris even goes so far that finally the name of the god becomes a common indication, a title of each person deceased. Osiris, N.N., is the deceased who possesses the power of resurrection, which Osiris has. The mystery of eternal life is identical for men and gods in every respect, from Egyptologist Jan Zandi. We can move on to the next slide. Uh, as the mythos of Osiris told how the physical decomposition of his corpse had been reversed, and he had been revivified physically, so was a like restoration looked for by his devotees. This restoration, in a practical manner, was achieved by the Egyptian ritual of embalmment. The ritual was patterned upon what was believed to have been done originally by Isis and Nephthys and other deities such as Anubis and Horus for Osiris in order to preserve his body and raise him from the dead, in fact, the whole mortuary ritual was presented as a reenactment of the transactions that secured the resurrection of Osiris. And in this reenactment, the deceased was ritually identified with or assimilated to Osiris. In other words, the principle of the Osirian ritual technique of salvation was that of sympathetic magic. We may safely conclude that the Egyptians believed that the saving efficacy of this Osirian mortuary ritual ultimately stemmed from the divine savior himself, whose primordial experience made such salvation possible. That's from Egyptologist, uh, or not, excuse me, not an Egyptologist uh, per se, but a uh, scholar of comparative religion, uh, SGF Brandon in his Redemption in Ancient Egypt. Uh, though not an Egyptologist per se, he was quite conversant with ancient Egyptian uh, religion, myth, and ritual. We can move on to the next slide. The Egyptian mortuary cult of Osiris. Uh, it has long been recognized that what in the pyramid texts was exclusively a royal mortuary ritual was gradually democratized so that in the process of time, its benefits could be enjoyed by all who could afford the minimum essentials of the Osirian obsequies. Such adaptation inevitably brought many changes as the ritual continued to be practiced throughout some 26 or more centuries. Indeed, until the forcible suppression of paganism in favor of Christianity in the 4th century AD. However, despite such consequent changes, the fundamental pattern of ritual assimilation was maintained, a fact which is surely of the greatest significance for the study of religious phenomenology. This continuity of tradition may be briefly illustrated by a chronological sequence of examples. So again, that's from SGF Brandon here uh, in The Savior God, Parrot of Studies and the Concept of Salvation. And then Brandon goes on uh, to cite the examples of the coffin text of the Middle Kingdom, the Book of the Dead from the New Kingdom, a papyrus from the Ptolemaic era, that's about 2nd or 3rd century BC, and finally, painted shrouds from the Greco-Roman period. So we see this long continuity of this idea which re basically remains intact in which the devotee is identified with Osiris and death so that they can be raised as he was to new life via this sort of ritual assimilation or mystical identification. We can move on to the next slide. So here we are seeing examples of uh, the Osiris's cult being infused or diffused uh, into the Greco-Roman world, into the wider Mediterranean. 
Uh, on the left, you see uh, Roman era funerary stella where Anubis leads the deceased to Osiris from about the first century BC to the fourth century. Uh, this is a, so it's a Roman style Egyptian depiction. It's, it's Greco-Roman, Greco-Egyptian syncretism. In the center, we have a Roman Egyptian funeral shroud of the deceased standing between Anubis and Osiris from about the second century CE. So once again, depicting a Romanized Egyptian syncretism. And in the, on the right, we have a uh, photo, or photo, a painting of uh, Nile, the Nile mosaic of Palestrina. That's uh, a Roman depiction of an Egyptian funeral procession from about the first century BC. So a lot of intermingling and and uh, cult cross cultural pollination between ancient Egypt and the Greco Roman world. Next slide. Now we're going to get into the Greco Roman mysteries of Isis and Osiris as it persisted into the Greco Roman world. The Greek historian Herodotus witnessed the Egyptian mysteries, as he called them, in the 5th century BC. Uh, the cult of uh, Isis and Osiris spread well into the Greco-Roman world by the 2nd century BC. In Apuleius' 2nd century CE work, Metamorphoses, the hero Lucius is initiated into the mysteries of Isis, whereby he approached the frontiers of death, and by a kind of voluntary death and salvation through divine grace, he returned in a manner reborn, set once more upon the course of renewed life. He is adorned with 12 cloaks and a radiant crown symbolizing the newborn sun. Uh, Mercea Eleade, scholar of comparative religion, says, we undoubtedly have here uh, an experience of death and resurrection for the hero of the metamorphoses. This day was the anniversary of his rebirth in the bosom of the mysteries. As we saw in ancient Egypt, the individual hoped for a posthumous identification with Osiris, that is, upon death. But by virtue of his initiation, the neophyte obtained here and now on earth this mystical identification with the god, as we, as we find it here in Apuleius' second century account, Metamorphoses. Moving on to the next slide. So, um, Mercea Eliade's suggestion that Lucius is identified here with the dying, rising Osiris is uh, in his ritual experience of death and rebirth is supported by scholarship elsewhere because Apuleius does not tell us in this portion uh, explicitly that Lucius is identified with Osiris, but these are inferences that other scholars are making uh, for pretty justifiable reasons. And we'll go on to that. Uh, in this cult, the initiate can be identified with none other than Osiris, but here, after a ceremony which depicts the visit of the sun god to the Osirian realm of the dead, the triumph over the dead is fittingly symbolized by an Osiris figure with solar attributes. An identification with the god is therefore present. That's from Egyptologist Gwen Griffiths. Griffith's conclusion is based on one, Lucy is receiving a radiant crown of palm leaves akin to the crown of justification, which symbolized Osiris's triumph over death as conferred to the deceased in ancient Egypt. Two, on the fact that Osiris was associated with solar symbolism in the Greco-Roman world, reflecting his earlier syncretism with Ray in Egypt. And three, on the long-standing tradition of identity with Osiris in the Egyptian funerary texts and its counterpart already in the Greco-Roman era, as noted above by S.G.F. Brandon. Um, so clearly, uh, Lucius, the initiate here um, in this uh, in this cult of Isis and Osiris that Apuleius is describing, is very likely being identified with Osiris as he undergoes this symbolic or metaphorical uh, mystical experience of death and rebirth and living a renewed life, being treated even as a divinity. Moving on to the next slide. 
the Greco-Roman mysteries of Isis, of Isis and Osiris continued. Uh, this is from Brooke W.R. Pearson. Uh, Apuleius's Metamorphoses, although it comes from the early, uh, from the second century CE, is likely indicative of a, of a long tradition of practice within the cult. In ancient times, the Osiris myth was the basis for what are perhaps the first mysteries, the lawful succession of the pharaohs, their burial and eventual union with Osiris in the afterlife. This mystery eventually became something in which not only kings, but other Egyptians could partake and in time spread across the known world, along with the worship of Isis and Serapis. For our purposes here, both of these elements separately and in combination suggest that the Isis initiate did indeed go through a process of identification with the god Osiris, and that this fact would have been the assumption behind the entire initiation process. In the first place, the ancient form of the Isis and Osiris mysteries clearly has the kings and later normal people identifying with the god Osiris in the hope of unification with him in the afterlife and even possibly in his resurrection. This is indisputable. We have no reason to think that the worship of Isis and Osiris or Serapis as it spread throughout the Greco-Roman world changed its essential myth in any great way. The initiate of the first century would surely have partaken in mysteries akin to those practiced throughout the history of the Isaiah cult. So um, it's really no use to say that... Uh, what we're reading here in Apuleius and the Metamorphoses is from the second century, which postdates much of what we have in the New Testament, because of course, uh, Apuleius is giving witness to a religious phenomenon that has very likely already been around for, for centuries. I mean, we see basically the conceptual roots of this ideology dating back all the Did we lose him? <clears throat> yep. For a moment, we lost him. He'll be right back. Bear with us. Everybody in the chat, let us know if you're liking the stream so far. Let the gods of YouTube hear us. Um, this helps Neil. And also, feel free, if you have any questions along the way, to super chat those questions. It all goes to helping Neil and Gnostic Informant. I hope everybody's doing well in the chat. And until Derek gets back, I'm just checking you out. And uh, I saw a criticism earlier, someone saying that there's going to be some fallacy here or something. Hey, super chat that fallacy, and let's see what Derek has to say in response. Now, will the gods send Derek back? Oh, there he is. What's up? Did I make a fallacious argument? And not yet. I Nobody's made anything but just a real short remark. Let's hope uh, we can get... Uh, you know, some super chats like challenging you if they disagree with your conclusions or whatever you're doing. So um, let's continue where you were. And thank you so much, Jason. So I thought you said for... something about super chat that. Huh? I thought you said something about super chat that fallacy. I'm like, what am I coming into here? Well, I'm saying like uh, if they they hear something you're saying wrong, super chat it. Um, I wanted. To oh, say sure, sure, you, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Jason Sobeck for advertising Derek Bennett's uh, YouTube channel. Good luck. Appreciate that, man. All right. Continue. I don't know where it cut me off, but I was basically just saying that um, it's no use suggesting that because Apuleius' account, the Metamorphoses, is from the second century, which postdates uh, much of the New Testament, that this is somehow a later phenomenon or borrowed from Christianity because Apuleius is basically giving witness to something that has likely been around for a very long time, for centuries, for millennia, because we see the conceptual roots of this ideology uh, dating back all the way to the third millennium BC in the pyramid texts in which uh, ancient Egyptians are identified with Osiris and death and raised to new life as he was. So at some point in the continuum of this uh, religious concept, uh, it has been made retrojected. That, that, that rebirth has been retrojected into the present among the living initiates. And uh, very likely prior to uh, when we're first getting this attestation from Apuleius, 
we don't have it earlier because these were mysteries. They were secrets. So we're just now getting a glimpse of what's going on here whenever Apuleius provides it in the second century. We can move on to the next slide. Uh, we're going to discuss here. Did we, I think I missed something too. Did I miss something? Nope. Nope. We're going to discuss baptism into Christ and its uh, religious significance. Scholarship and primary source texts thus suggest that by the first century, we have a Greco-Roman mystery religion which, with features inherited from ancient Egypt, wherein individuals undergo an initiation symbolizing death and rebirth, brought about by ritual identification with a god who likewise died and rose to new life. This is strikingly similar to the way in which Paul describes baptism in Romans 6. As he says, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. Similar expressions are found elsewhere, such as in Colossians 2.12, uh, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. So we can move on to the next slide here. And Derek, just affirm for me real quick that uh, we are in sync and moving on to the next slide. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The Christian initiate, the ISIS initiate, right? I just wanted to hear your voice. All right. <laughs> so uh, this is basically a very simplified chart kind of comparison. Uh, compare the Christian initiate uh, who was baptized into Christ Jesus, into his death, buried with him through baptism into death, just as the Isis initiate uh, approached the frontiers of death, experiencing a kind of voluntary death and salvation. Then uh, the Christian initiate, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, for the Isis initiate, so that just as Osiris had been raised from the dead, as we're able, uh, as other scholars are able to infer uh, in terms of what's going on here, that they too may live a new life. And for the Isis initiate, they too are set once more upon the course of renewed life. Some pretty astonishing. Um, coincidences or similarities here in terms of soteriology, that is salvation schema, between what we see in Christianity and what we see in the uh, cult of Isis and Osiris, which had a much, much older pedigree. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, baptism to Christ continued. Uh, Elizabeth McCabe draws numerous parallels between the Isis cult and Pauline scriptures, including uh, concepts of uh, the experience of dying, new life or self, resurrection or being raised, uh, mystery, initiation, salvation, identity, identity with the divine and eternal life. Uh, that's from Elizabeth McCabe's An Examination of the Isis Cult with Preliminary Exploration into New Testament Studies. These are fascinating works. When you see these works cited in the slides, be sure to check them out for yourself and and, uh, and dive in even more fully than what you're getting in, in this presentation alone. Moving on to the next slide. We have uh, the Osiris cult in Rome. So this is from the fourth century Christian uh, apologist and church father just, or excuse me, Firmicus Maternus. Uh, and it goes to show us that the Osiris cult is still going strong all the way into the fourth century in Rome um, until it was finally stamped out by Roman emperors such as Theodosius in favor of Christianity. As Firmicus Maternus says, 
on a certain knife, the image is placed face up on a bier and is lamented by many with divided mournings. Then, when they have satisfied themselves with this imagined lamentation, a light is brought in. At that time, the throat of all who mourned was anointed by the priest. After this anointing, the priest whispered the following in a slow muttering. Rejoice, initiates, since the God is redeemed, for salvation from suffering shall be ours. Why do you encourage wretched men to rejoice? Why do you urge deceived men to be glad? What hope, what salvation do you promise to that in sorrowful belief? Why do you arouse them with a false promise? Death is the sign of your God. His life does not appear. Neither has a divine oracle proclaimed at any time his resurrection. So Firmicus Maternus is unwittingly um, witnessing to this belief uh, in the resurrection of Osiris among these pagans in Rome. As he says, you bury an idol, you bewail the idol, you carry an idol from the tomb, and when you have done this, you wretched one, rejoice. You redeem your own God. You put together the, the members of stone. You arrange the lifeless stone. Your God might give thanks to you, might repay you with similar gifts, and might desire for you to become his participants. May you thus die as he dies and live as he lives. As um, Clarence Forbes, who discusses this in detail in his translation of the text, says, uh, Firmicus Maternus condenses here the basic ideology of the mysteries, which uh, they, they become participants uh, in the experience of the God and his death and resurrection, and they die as he dies and live as he lives. So much thanks to Firmicus Maternus for unwittingly providing us this information. We can move on to the next slide. Again, to recap Firmicus Maternus's statement, your God might repay you with similar gifts and might desire for you to become his participants. May you thus die as he dies and live as he lives. Uh, uh, here I quoted, uh, I quote uh, Clarence Forbes as saying, though Firmicus uh, speaks contemptuously, he actually condenses in the short sentence, the essential doctrine of the mystery religions, that the mystay by initiation and ritual acts gained a share in the divine life and a guarantee of immortality. Uh, Firmicus's account is from the fourth century CE, though it has roots in much earlier practices at Abydos, where a statue or idol of the vindicated and resurrected Osiris was carried in the festival in the festival procession of Ikernefret, according to a well-known stella of the Middle Kingdom. That's per Egyptologist Jan Osman. So we know that this kind of um, this kind of practice or procession was nothing new as it's described by Apuleius in the second century CE. It goes back to much, much earlier, more archaic practices in ancient Egypt. Once again, uh, this goes to show that the legacy of Osiris, his resurrection and its meaning to those who celebrated it persisted well into the early centuries of Christianity and pervaded the Greco-Roman world. We may move on to the next slide. So out of Egypt um, and, and what scholars have to say uh, about Egypt's impact on the wider Greco-Roman world at large, despite the greater antiquity of Egyptian civilization, when we refer to Egyptian and Greco-Roman cultures, we are generally referring to cultures that were contiguous. And the profound impact that Egyptian ideas had upon the Greco-Roman world cannot be denied. In key respects, Egyptian views of the afterlife foreshadowed Greco-Roman, Jewish, and early Christian conceptions. It is worthy of mention that the Greeks themselves accepted the derivation of many elements of their cults from the Egyptians. Herodotus, for example, wrote that the names of the gods came to Hellas, that is from Greece, uh, from barbarians, and I myself concluded that they derived specifically from Egypt. 
indeed Herodotus goes on to maintain that many of the central religious observances of the Greeks were also derived from Egypt, writing that these customs have been adopted by the Hellenes from the Egyptians. That's from Eliezer Gonzalez, the traditional Egyptian antecedents of Greco-Roman post-mortem ascent. Uh, you can find this entire uh, article on academia.edu, so be sure to check it out for yourself. Moving on to the next slide. So the variants of this that we find in the Greco-Roman world, we're going to discuss the Orphic Mysteries of Dionysus. In the Orphic Mysteries of Dionysus, the young godling is viciously dismembered by the Titans, but restored to life variously according to different myths. Philodemus records that after his dismemberment by the Titans, Rhea gathered together his limbs and he came to life again. That's from Philodemus' On Piety. You can find much the same in Diodorus Siculus' Library of History. Uh, Plutarch explicitly identifies Dionysus with Osiris, stating that the tales regarding the Titans and the rites celebrated by night agree with the accounts of the dismemberment of Osiris and his revivification and regenesis from Plutarch's On Isis and Osiris. Again, find this in Diodorus Siculus' Library of History. So there's been some clear synchronization between the Egyptian Osiris and the Greek Dionysus. Just as in the Isis and Osiris mysteries, the Orphic initiate seeks death and rebirth as an immortal god. Gold tablets from the 3rd to 4th century BC state the following. You have just died and have just been born, thrice happy on this day. Tell Persephone that Bacchus, that is Dionysus himself, has liberated you. You have been born a god, from the man that you were, happy and fortunate one, you will be a god from the mortal that you were. Um, so the initiate is essentially they have died and been reborn, divinized and treated as a god who is now immortal. The Orphic Mysteries continued, if we may go to the next slide here. It is repeatedly stressed in the texts that initiates are thrice blessed or thrice happy, just as Dionysus was thrice born. Uh, the first time from his mother, the second time from the thigh, and the third when after his dismemberment by the Titans, Rhea gathered together uh, his limbs and he came to life again for Philodemus. So uh, saying that the initiate is thrice born or thrice happy is essentially identifying them with Dionysus, who was thrice born. Uh, quote, the revivified Dionysus who died and came back to life again was regarded as a divine role model for the Dionysiac initiates and their expectations of a happy afterlife. Dionysus fulfills a purificatory purificatory function in a personal and eschatological sense. He assists the initiate at the junction of the limit between life and death, between the human and the divine. Thus we see that the formula in any one of its variants is always expressed after a reference to a rebirth as a god after death. Whatever interpretation we are to give this phrase must therefore move between the coordinates of rebirth and identification with a god, both of which conditions produce a great happiness. And notice it's the same kind of thing in Christianity. You're, you're not just you're not just resurrected to the same old, plain, ordinary life that you once lived. No, you are now adopted sons of God who are made immortal in Christ's image, and you are basically divinized. That's why uh, in Eastern Christianity, and such as the Greek Orthodox Church, has no problem whatsoever with the concept of theosis or divinization, because it's very much alive and present in the New Testament texts, and especially in the Pauline corpus. So it's, it's a very similar notion of not just, not just being um, 
brought back to your former mode of existence, but a new mode of existence in which you are essentially divinized and immortalized. Moving on to the next slide. The mysteries of Zalmoxis. Uh, certain ancient authors, as well as a number of modern scholars, have connected Zalmoxis with Dionysus and Orpheus, since the most characteristic elements of his cult make it comparable to the mysteries. That's from uh, Mercea Eliade in A History of Religious Ideas. Uh, the devotees of Zalmoxis claim to be immortal, states Herodotus, for they believe that they do not die, but that he who perishes goes to the god Zalmoxis. Having learned from Pythagoras, he made a hall where he entertained and feasted the chief among his countrymen and taught them that neither he nor his guests nor any of their descendants should ever die, but that they should go to a place where they would live forever and have all good things. Uh, very strong resonances and resemblances with uh, the images that we find in the New Testament. Herodotus states that Zalmoxis hid away in an underground chamber for three years while his Thracian devotees mourned him for dead, though upon his return, they came to believe all that he had told them. So Herodotus provides us with a skeptical account, though the inference is that the Thracians themselves believed he had died and returned, assuring them of their own immortality. So very much a mysterious sophic or mystery religion idea present here in the cult of Zalmoxis, and very possibly as a result of cultural diffusion and synchronization with uh, uh, either Dionysus or perhaps a mixture of Dionysus and Osiris. So we can move on to the next slide. And here we are going to discuss the mysteries of Eleusis, which was very popular and very widespread in the Greek world. The Eleusinian mysteries were based on the myth of Persephone's abduction by Hades into the realm of the dead, from which she returned annually to the world of the living. Demeter, the mother of Persephone, bewailed the loss of her daughter, resulting in seasonal sterility. But when Persephone returned, life and vitality were restored. Both deities were personifications of grain, Demeter, the mature grain with maternal potency, and Persephone, the newly planted grain of the, of the autumn sowing. Like the planted seed, Persephone sprouts to new life, a case in which life emerges after death in the world of vegetation. From uh, Marvin Meyer in The Ancient Mysteries, a source book of sacred texts. Initiates into the mysteries of Eleusis shared a special kinship with the goddess. Their fate was compared with the death of the planted seed and its emergence to new life. So some ancient texts concerning the mysteries of Eleusis. Happy is he among men upon earth who has seen these mysteries, but he who is uninitiate and has no part in them never has lot of like good things once he is dead, down in the darkness and gloom. That's from Hesiod. Uh, happy he who has seen this before descending underground. He knows the end of life. He also knows its beginning. Thrice happy those among mortals who, having seen those mysteries, will go down to Hades. Only they can have true life there. For the rest, all there is evil. So we see in the mysteries of Eleusis, this idea that the fate of the goddess uh, in which they undergo some kind of death but are restored to the world of the living or to new life uh, is shared by those who, in, who are initiated into the cult. And uh, there's even something of an ominous warning here that unless you have Unless you have sought this salvation, basically, and unless you have been reborn in such a way, there is no life for you upon death. All there is is, is, is death and darkness and gloom. So, again, very evocative of, of what we find also, conceptually anyway, in the New Testament. We may move on to the next slide. 
So discussing the mysteries in Paul, um, very much present in the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. Um, in Phaedrus, Plato speaks of planting seeds in the garden of Adonis so that they may bear fruit and arrive at perfection, a nod to the Eleusinian mysteries into which he himself had been initiated. Paul likewise appeals to the death of the planted seed and its sprouting to new life in order to expound on the nature of the resurrection body, as he says. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish! What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed, he gives its own body. So Paul very much employing the conceptualism and the language and ideas of the mysteries here. Paul employs also the terminology of the mysteries, including mysterion, uh, hidden, secret, mystery was its meaning. Telios, uh, mature, complete, or perfected. And nipios, uh, infant, child, or babe. So those initiated into the mysteries were shown the secret of how they might be transformed from the buried seed into the perfected and mature crop. Um, they'll be getting as babes or infants upon their rebirth. Paul is thus employing the imagery, terminology, and conceptions of the mysteries, of the ancient mysteries. As he says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed, but each in turn, beginning with Christ, the first fruits. So all of this is bound up in expressions of, of the crops and the mystery of crop life and vegetation and how that applies, how that is applied to man and the human sphere. Um, you know, and, and, and how they came to understand the gods and goddesses who, under, who underwent these same processes and were able to extend them to their devotees. We may move on to the next slide. So we're just going to give a recap on the mysteries here. The central figure is a god or goddess who has triumphed over death in some form, either by bodily resurrection, rebirth, or return from the realm of the dead. Then the initiate undergoes a ritual death and rebirth, either in this life or the next, which is modeled upon the central god's triumph over death. The initiate is divinized and reborn as a god in the Isaac and Orphic mysteries by a process of ritual identification with the central deity. The initiate is made immortal by their deification and granted a blessed afterlife in the world beyond. The imagery and terminology is bound up in the expression of solar, seasonal, or agricultural death and rebirth. The dead and buried seed and its sprouting to new life, the maturity of the fully developed crop, the newborn sun rising from the waters, etc. The concept of salvation is a key component expressed repeatedly in Apuleius' Metamorphoses and in the Mysteries of Eleusis, whereby the initiate avoids the darkness, gloom, and evil of Hades. Moving on to the next slide. So, uh, dying and rising with Christ. Uh, this is from Jennifer Uzel, The Relationship Between Hellenistic Mystery Religions and Early Christianity, uh, from just back in 2009. That early Christianity should continue to protect, that early Christianity should continue to protect, to practice baptism as a sign of membership of the new society and for the forgiveness of sins is not surprising. Nor is it surprising, given the proximity and cultural interaction between the Jewish and Hellenistic worlds, that baptism should bear some formal and even functional similarity to ritual bathing practiced by the mysteries. What 
is surprising, however, is that at least some Christians, among them one of the most innovative and influential thinkers of the early church, that's Paul, should come to understand baptism in terms of an apotheosis with a dying and resurrected deity, securing a new and risen life in Christ. The idea of a God in human form is utterly alien to Judaism, and indeed, even Paul stopped short of saying this unambiguously. The idea that a human could become one with God and share in his risen life is even more inconceivable. It is difficult to see how these ideas in particular could have entered the mindset of early Christians had they not, at the very least, been drawing upon or drawing on the ideas and symbols of the pagan religions around them. At a very early stage, there was some level on which some Christians saw themselves as dying and rising with Christ and as sharing in his resurrected life. The most natural place to look for the origins of this understanding must surely be in the Hellenistic ideology of the mysteries. Again, you don't find this, uh, any form of this, uh, in Judaism. Certainly, uh, in Judaism, they had developed mysteries and initiations in the Hellenistic period, of course, as we find, uh, I think, in Qumran and the Dead Sea Scrolls. So that's already uh, Hellenized Judaism. But more specifically, this notion of experiencing death and rebirth in unison with the God who had done the same is... I mean, where else do you suppose they're getting this? Perhaps Paul just completely innovated or, or, or made up this idea or sort of one of his predecessors. But when it was, if it was already present in that very environment, gee whiz, where do you suppose it's coming from? Hmm. We may move on to the next slide. From martyrdom to mystery. So this is basically giving something of a chronological historical account of how this probably developed within Christianity. Christianity began as a sect within Judaism. Jesus' death on the cross was interpreted within the framework of Jewish beliefs about vicarious suffering, martyrdom, and atonement, such as the sacrificial cult and the suffering servant of Isaiah. Belief in the resurrection of Jesus likewise originated within second and temple Jewish beliefs about the resurrection of the dead, inspired also by the Hebrew scriptures, such as Isaiah and the Psalms, where expressions of death are followed by vindication and exaltation. As early Christianity spread into the wider Greco-Roman world among diaspora Jews and God-fearing Greeks, it began to absorb elements known to the mysteries. The message of a dying, rising Messiah would have been all too easy to associate with other dying, rising analogs from the mysteries. Absent the mysteries, Jewish Christianity would have been a message about Christ's sin atoning death on the cross and his resurrection as a sign of God's imminent kingdom on earth and the forthcoming resurrection of all the righteous dead. From the mysteries came additional layers of meaning that Christ's death and resurrection was a divine act in which we could ritually participate dying to our corruptible nature and being reborn in the image of the risen Christ. And we may move on to the last slide. So just a couple of uh, snippets or extractions from uh, actual scholars on, on the comparison of Christianity and the mysteries. Um, this is from, the first one is from Samuel Sandmel. This is the guy who coined the term parallelomania. So granted, Sandmel was able to detect parallelomania at some, at some times where too much is made of, of various parallels between Christianity and pagan religions. He nonetheless recognized the significance of uh, the similarities between Pauline Christianity and the mysteries. As he says, the similarities between Pauline Christianity and the mystery religions need to be recognized, for only then can one glimpse what Paul was offering his hearers was not a new purpose or a new vision, but a new form of a familiar need and goal. He was teaching not a different salvation, but a newer version, 
and as he insisted, the only form of salvation, not a strange or recondite religious goal, but what he considered to be the sure and sole means of achieving the commonly recognized goal of religion. Rabbi Samuel Sandow. And lastly, in Christianity, the ancient story of the dying and rising of the, of the divine, of crops, of humans of all, may reach a powerful conclusion, and the piety of the mysteries may achieve may achieve a final vindication. That's from uh, the late uh, the late Marvin Meyer in the Ancient Mysteries, a source book of sacred texts. Marvin Meyer was a brilliant scholar of early Christianity, translated many of these texts from the, from the Greek into uh, the Gnostic Gospels that we have available to us today. So that is the last slide, and we may uh, move on to our commentary and Super Chats. <clears throat> that was awesome. Um, it just makes me want to re-examine all over again everything that I've learned and know. I hope everybody in the chat liked it, and if you did like the video, Drop a comment. In fact, we might as well as we go into this. I'm curious. Hit a one if you've loved this presentation. I did this on my channel. Hit a one right now and let me know how you feel. If you like this presentation, let's see some ones in the chat. Just drop a one and enter. If you didn't like this presentation, drop a two. Let's see some ones. Hopefully, no twos. But if you, I'd rather you be honest. Just lay it out there. Let's see this thing. You got one here by Nun Believer, Justina, hope I'm saying that properly, A Noni, Cameron, Lauren. Look, we're losing Derek as we're going through this right now. So he'll be he'll resurrect from the dead here in just a second. Um Daniel, Sharon, Grr, Streams, Ryan Druff, Thou, one one. Mosean, forgive me if I butcher your name. BWT, I'm not even going to go through the whole thing. Lucid. We got John Collins. Lucid didn't like it. Lucid, I'd love to see Super Chat some criticisms. John Collins. Emmy Love in the house. Thank you again. Voting again. It's so good you got to vote again and again and again. Look, you can vote once, you can vote twice, three times. Why not, right? Um, Seriously, appreciate you in the chat. I really, really appreciate that. Okay, we're back. Derek's back. Derek, you resurrected, proving that it is a real phenomena. So uh, we had a lot of people in the chat. We got one, two. I'm hoping that uh, you know we can get some criticism and in, in support of Neil, what Neil does here. So anyway, um, let's get to Super Chats. Thank you so much. The YouTube algorithm pays attention to that stuff, and I appreciate that. Gaius Julius Windex, do we know of any other mystery cults that use Eucharist or baptisms or baptism for initiation? Did we lose him again? We may have lost him again. Be patient, please. We're going to get through these. All right, did lose him. Don't worry, he's coming back. I'm just going back down to the bottom to check you all out. And thank you guys for such a big super chat and helping Neil with what he's doing. So really appreciate it. Lucid said, I'm not going to pay you super chat if I didn't like a guy reading a PowerPoint. Oh, well, that's just like I woke up on the wrong side of the bed kind of criticism. I was thinking you like legit had an actual criticism instead of a gripe. Um, Gaius Julius Windex, again, there's the super chat. Derek, are you with us? Hello. 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 Are you, are thou with us? Let me make sure. Yeah, I've lowered my, my resolution, so it's not to the pixels aren't too much. Derek, are you are you with us? We're going to do this. We're going to make sure. I'd like to get his facial expressions here. But it's almost worth getting the audio. 
Um, he might be using his phone. I want to get his facial expressions so that he can respond. Bear with me here, everybody. Um, he is uh, in the sticks of Kentucky trying to make this happen. So bear with me. Bear with me. And thank you for everybody dropping all the love in the chat. We will get to it. Derek, are you still struggling to try and make it? <laughs> I don't know what's going on at this moment, but maybe the mysteries are not wanting the mysteries to be disclosed. Bear with me here. Oh, I'm not going to call him. He's popping in another window. Let's see if this thing works. I'm going to wait till I see him in the little box so I know he's fully in. Derek. His <laughs> internet. The internet sucks. Right? Blink twice if you can hear us. Yeah. Yeah. Lucid, go sleep and wake up on the right side of the bed, man. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. People, people shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't organize your presentations ever when you go to do this kind of stuff. You should never ever try to do that. You know, M. David Litwood does that, but you know, um, what do you do? What do you do? Uh, you know, making sure the facts are actually quotes. Do you're supposed to memorize all these quotes from scholars and from the source material. Come on, come on, give us a break. Go take a nap. Let me take, uh, let me call Derek. Let me try it this way. Cause I can get him audio on here. We'll make it, we'll, he'll you'll probably even be able to hear him better. Hey, buddy. Dude, how's Hades? Because obviously you didn't go to heaven. <laughs> hey, uh, I'm going to I'm gonna mess around with my phone here and see if I can kind of refresh some stuff and come okay. right back with you there, okay? All right, all right. We're here waiting. Okay. All Good right. Day. Be right back. All right, bye. Bear with us, ladies and gentlemen. Don't forget to check out Neil's uh, Patreon and, of course, Derek Bennett's Patreon and then his YouTube channel. It is, or I, I put it at the beginning of the chat. And um, this is, what What did I just post here? Wrong thing. Okay, there you go. Um What is this? Gnostic informant said, did Neil post that? Did I post that? Hold on. I don't even know. Sometimes it's it's funky because I'm trying to. I might have posted that and it comes up as Neil. Hold on. Bear with me, please. Ignore that StreamYard link. I'm just waiting on him to pop in here, so bear with me. I hope everybody's doing okay and the holidays are getting close. Woke up with this guy on my chest. I just, he wouldn't leave. And I was like, I'm not going to, you know, do anything to kick you out of here. There's no reason why I would do that. But I, I want to hear his response to this particular. I know as far as baptism and Eucharist go, we I'm sure he's going to bring up Osiris, which is pretty clear. Um, I absolutely can't wait. I definitely can't wait. Um, I know Osiris definitely had a communal beer and uh, eating of the bread or corn bread may be the case. But they had a mystery there. And then, of course, I saw some people earlier bring up, at the very beginning of the stream, we're bringing up um, Brian Murdescu's book on him talking about what he thinks is the immortality key, which was ingesting psychedelics, some substance or whatever. And he is trying to make a case in the book that he thinks the early Christian community is participating with this uh, by talking about a love feast. 
I've asked some academics, uh, other academics, and they're not convinced of it. I've done that for a while. But as far as these rituals go and baptism and Eucharist, I'm curious to see the baptism explanation where he goes with that. Eucharist, I'm pretty confident on the Osiris thing. But let's hear what he has to say. I definitely can't wait to see it. All right. Bear with us. Bear with us. Derek's still trying to figure out this thing. Let me see what some of the new chat's talking about. Oh, and another thing you can do, throwing it out there, there is a mysteries course that you can help Neil out if you go down in the description and sign up for the mysteries course that Li David Litwa did. And uh, in that one, he goes through seven different ancient Greek mysteries. And one of them is Christianity, of course. So check that out. Check it out. Sharon thinks that the immortality key is the cerebrospinal fluid rising and the anointing of the pituitary and hypothalamus secretion, something like that. I don't go that far, but I've heard it before. I've even heard like, um, I think, what is it? Uh, Jim Carrey and stuff like they, they all go to those kind of levels of explanation and stuff. So this just my thoughts, but I definitely don't rule out like how they saw their body and experience somehow with the substances or even the initiation act. So just my experience. Hey, that's cool. I look, I'm not knocking people's experiences because I've done psychedelics in the past and I can't say that that would be the words I would describe it, but maybe it was a certain thing you did. Don't know. I don't know if that's the experience you're describing or if it was some type of mystery practice that you were involved in or whatnot. What up? What up? What up? Welcome. We're waiting on D Derek is in the bottom, but I don't see his face yet, which means we're trying to get this worked out. And I'm just staying with the checks. We're going to dwell on these Q and a super chats here in a minute. I apologize for the technical difficulties here. Um, <laughs> let's, let's see how this goes. So Will of L. Yon says, I've survived all the books from Bart Ehrman, Richard Courier, and I'm still here believing in Jesus. Well, that's, I mean, I, I good for you. I don't know what, everybody pat Will of L. Yon on the back right now. Pat him on the back. Yeah, I'm say, pat him on the back. Uh, anyway, appreciate that comment. You're adding to the skepticism in the world and the mysteries and all of the heresies that you probably are against. Just saying, you're helping us here. I appreciate it. Thank you, Daniel. You're on board. Melody gets Melody gets it. This is like inner circle talk here. I really appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, hey, you're right. Give them credit for at least reading or saying that they've read the scholarship on this. You know what I mean? You got to at least give them some credit, you know, got to, got to look, we got some Pat Pats in the chat chats. Look at this on the Pat Pat, Derek Sanders, Pat Pat. Not to worry, Derek. I'm on kept my extremities. Well, lubricated. He does keep things lubricated in his communications, So don't worry. <laughs> so I'm like, Whoa. Some of the things he says, I'm like, Wow. He's a uh, blunt. What do you do? What do you do? Lauren in the chat. Good to see you here, Lauren. It is good to see you. And uh, <laughs> Melissa's says, good shock. Shma. It's doubtful. Pass up. Pun intended, Richard Carey and Bart Aaron. I called them Aaron and Carey Curry. Of course, we know that. We we understand your, your language here. I get what you're doing here. This is true. I mean... If Ralph Ellis saw what was going on today, he would imagine that Derek Bennett, Derek Lambert, and of course, where's the other Derek in here that just commented that was giving pat pats on the back backs. Anyway, like he would say I'd had multiple accounts here and it's really all me and that Derek's just some sloppy twin of me or something, you know, cause he can't compare, you know what I mean? Like, duh. If he was here right now, he'd be talking crap. It's what we do. We're, we're like bros, so we do that. That's what we do. But um, there, 
Derek Sanders, which is me secretly writing a comment to myself here on Gnostic Informant. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> come on, Derek, please. I see you in the bottom and I don't, please, Derek, come back. Maybe you heard me talking crap. Okay, he's here. Hey, Bro. kids. Can I can I shoot you Q and A's? Absolutely, let's do it. Okay, we're scrolling up, man. We're we're gonna try and do it while while you have internet and do this thing right. I'm just look. I I, I didn't have anything on my mind to really do to like distract everybody. I wasn't planning on this. So uh, Gaius Julius Windex says, do we know any other mystery cults that use Eucharist or baptism for initiation? Um, so we, we do know of baptismal type practices in these other cults. Um, and of course, um, there were uh, uh, communal meals and communal meals and such. I think you have to understand that's pretty universal stuff. So, you know, there's no reason to think that, that those, that the, the external form of the right is anything that Christianity needed to borrow from these other cults. Um, as we know, uh, Jews before Christianity were practicing baptism as sort of a purificatory right and had a, a, communal meal uh, uh, as well. So um, this is stuff that uh, at least the external, the exoteric form of the rite uh, is almost certainly, you know, straight from Judaism. It's the esoteric or the internal spiritualized significance that is, that is endowed upon these rites that that seems to be coming from the mystery. And that's exactly what Jennifer Uzel points out uh, in that passage that I included in my presentation, which is what seems to be happening is, is that Paul and whoever else might have come before him, he's taking these Jewish rites and he's putting a mystery religion spin on them. So the Eucharist comes from Judaism, but Paul has endowed it with the meaning that you're partaking of the flesh and blood of Christ. Baptism was a Jewish rite, but in Paul, uh, it's not just a purificatory rite, but it's an actually a mystical identification with Christ uh, in the process of his death death and rebirth. So he's taking Jewish rites and putting a mysterious sophic or mystery religion type um, meaning and significance to them. Hmm. It makes me wonder if Paul initiated that or not, you know what I mean, as far as adding those elements to it. But it's, I don't know if we'll ever know the answer fully to that, but it might, I don't know. It's interesting. Thank you for that. Ted Francis, thank you for the super chat. Thoughts on Orphic and Neo-Pythagorean influences on Christianity and Gnostics? Um, you know, that's a good question. I mean, I think we can at least say that these ideas, this kind of mysticism, which was prevalent in the mysteries, um, during the very time, in the very place from which Christianity emerged, that there is very likely some kind of influence. And Jennifer Uzel points that out as well, is where are they getting this idea? It doesn't come from Judaism. You know, it's just, that's not there. And the likelihood that Paul or his predecessors invented this whole cloth when the such notions were already present in that milieu, that mm -hmm. seems very unlikely as well. So certainly there's some kind of influence now from which of these cults, who knows? Um, Paul was, if we, you know, if we trust what Acts has to say about him, a native of Tarsus and Cilicia, uh, in Asia minor. And we know that uh, based on archaeological finds that the cult of Attis was popular there. Now, 
references to the death and resurrection of Addis come late. They are certainly post-Christian, but it's very possible that at some point the Addis cult was syncretized uh, with these other cults, such as with Dionysus and, 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 and Osiris, uh, so that maybe something very much like that was already swimming around. But then again, Paul is going to these different churches throughout the Greco-Roman world, like um, in Ephesus and and Corinth and so you know whatnot, so he's he's the he's marketing Christianity to these people in a way that will resonate with them, and mm-hmm. so either Paul or someone before him is is picking up these ideas, and and naturally, as you have an influx of God fearing Greeks into Judaism and and Hellenized Jews, um, you know. Th- these ideas are going to just quite naturally, very organically, not a conspiracy or anything um, uh, deliberate or conspiratorial or anything like that. It's just naturally going to happen. But from which of these mm-hmm. cults, who's to say? All we can say is that this was widespread, these personal salvation cults uh, during this time. And uh, Christianity is, is clearly picking it up from somewhere. It's in mm-hmm. the air. Thank you so much, Ted. Appreciate your answer, Derek. Samantha Jennings, thank you so much. Salvation through ISIS by water ritual, but don't the Jews already have mikvah, which is exactly what you're mentioning, the Jewish, they already have this. Or is mikvah not a salvific yeah. function? I just touched on that. Yeah. Right, right. Or at least not in the sense that Paul is portraying it. Yeah. Uh, among the Jews, it would never have been regarded as a mystical experience of death and rebirth with a God who had done the same. It's just thoroughly un-Jewish. Yeah. Uh, kind of interesting. Jesus gets baptized in the Jordan and this is in Mark, which is kind of a hidden mystery kind of gospel. I think at least the identity of him is hidden. So I'm wondering if there's kind of like this rewrite of Moses where he's going through this Jordan river and you also need to pass through the waters kind of with Christ. Anyway, there's a lot of, I, I wonder what kind of connections we might draw, but maybe that might be over connecting things that aren't directly there. We should go earlier in Paul, but yeah, thank you so much, Samantha for that. I hope he did answer your question and we do appreciate the support. Um, Yakuv says Jewish mystery religions began in Alexandria. Um, it's certainly possible it began there. I mean, Alexandria was a multicultural cosmopolitan hub where all of these ideas were mixing and merging. And you had an influx of Jewish people like Philo of Alexandria, who was mixing all of this up. Uh, it's where the, uh, the Greek version of the Hebrew Bible was translated into the Septuagint. So there's a lot of activity going on there in, Exa- in Alexandria. And I, and I think we can, um, man, it's, it's who knows what all <laughs> went down there. But at the same time, like, again, Tar- Paul being from Tarsus in Asia Minor, Tarsus was another multicultural cosmopolitan hub where a lot of this was going on. I think even Damascus was. So these ideas were so widespread and so prominent um, throughout the Mediterranean at this time that it could, it it could have been coming from um, multiple tributaries, multiple places, multiple cults, uh, participants and adherents uh, who had been, uh, initiated into these mysteries. Um, it's, but it's, it's almost impossible to pin down exactly from from where we just know, generally speaking that it, it must've happened. Yeah. Thank you, Yakub. Thank you for that super chat and great question. Uh, Jamie again, thank you, Derek Bennett for the presentation. You are much welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Jamie again says, uh, and thank you for that. Does Demuzi's death, Demuzi's death and rebirth influence the Christ? Um, most certainly not in any direct way. And I don't know of any kind of um, 
mystery religion interpretation that was ever given to Demuzi, or at least it's not in evidence. Um, John Granger Cook, in his Empty Tomb, Resurrection, and Apotheosis, uh, he does categorize Demuzi or Tammuz as among these dying and rising gods, but he says that it is a much looser analogy uh, than, than the closer analogies, which would, especially Osiris, as he says, Osiris is the closest analogy to the death and resurrection of Christ in terms of a death and bodily resurrection scenario versus the, the sort of catabasis that we have with uh, like Demuzi or earlier versions of, of Adonis uh, or Persephone, who basically go to the underground realm of the dead and, and return from there. So it's, um, hmm. um, there are closer analogies, I think. Thank you, Jamie. Appreciate that response. Again, Jamie, thrice great Hermes, any relation to thrice born? Um, wouldn't surprise me in the least. Uh, I think this probably originates with Dionysus, but you've probably got there some syncretism with uh, with Hermes as well. I mean, they were just doing that. Syncretism was, was rampant, rampant during the Hellenistic period. Now, it was going on well before then. I mean, good grief. We, we see this already uh, happening in, in Judaism from, I mean, the, during the 6th century BC, it's it, Judaism's getting Persianized, and there are good reasons for thinking that that is the case. Um, and, and, and Judaism was already something of a, an intermingling of Canaanite, Mesopotamian, and even some Egyptian, as we discussed earlier. So syncretism is as, is as old as the day is long, but it was particularly rampant during the Hellenistic pe period after Alexander the Great had conquered half the known world. And, and so you had this, this great sort of um, cosmopolitan, multicultural atmosphere in which mm. these ideas were just mixing and merging all the time. Thank you, Jamie, again. Uh, Justina, I wonder if Jesus' parables or seed and sowing have any significance to the agricultural aspects of these mystery religions. I think they undoubtedly do. <laughs> um, I mean, you're you're talking about a remarkable coincidence if yeah. they don't. I mean, he's not just the, – the weight of the evidence, the cumulative effect – of all of these coincidences and parallels is such that it you're almost burying your head in the historical sands to deny that this that kind of syncretism and influence is going on here. Mm -hmm. He's not just using you know the the imagery, the death of the planted seed and it's sprouting to new life. But he's using the very terminology of the, these mysteries, Mysterion, uh, Talios. Nepios, as well as the the kind of mystical conceptions of death and rebirth in unison with the God. It's it's anyone who tries to deny that there is some kind of linkage here is I think they're fooling themselves. Just to add to what you said briefly and getting to the next super chat is I've heard people try to argue, no, these are mundane parables to just farmers and to this or to that. And what's funny about that to me is if you go back to the agricultural mysteries, they're writing to farmers and agricultural people and shepherds. Like, what's there's like that's not a good argument to pretend that this is like literally writing to a real farmer who's just planting seed. It's like that's kind of the point. Like, people would understand these analogies, and this is how you would do it. So, uh, I've heard that argument about Christianity that the parables are just, or these things are just to like mundane farmers who just. You know, they'd get these little inside labor jokes and it's like, yeah, sure. I mean, if, if you straw man it and just excise that, uh, that particular parallel without any context whatsoever, um, you can try to argue that. But, uh, mm -hmm. as I've, I think I've demonstrated that's fallacious. You're right. I'm with you. I, I think there's something going on there as well. Great. Oop, 
something kick. Oh yeah, we're good. Uh, great point. Joshua Owens says, love your work. Gracias, amigo, and love your support. Thank you, Josh. And notice Josh puts with the 616. Hmm. The Latin form of the Mark of the Beast. Or at least I hear the early Latin manuscripts of 616. Kaiser Neron. <laughs> Derek mm. Sanders in the house. Derek is thrice born. And if you notice something, the way that he spelled the name in this, it's actually a syncretism between your name and mine. Mm -hmm. Do you yeah. see the combination yeah. here? Because yours is spelled D-E-R-R-E-C-K and mine is D-E-R-E-K. So you're missing the second R and I'm just take out the C and you've got my name. My name's spelled the same as Derek Sanders. Derek, you, you thought this one through. I could see where you're going with this. You're like IQ levels way beyond the typical. Thank you so much for that super chat. <laughs> Mr. Monster in the house. Thank you for being a member of practically all of our channels. The mystery of the flying space Jesus. Isn't the whole sacrifice null and void when he comes back to life anyways? Yes, he was temporarily inconvenienced for your sins. Um, I don't know. It's, it's you know, honestly, it's... Uh, you, you can tackle this stuff in terms of pure philosophy if you want, but I prefer just going straight to the history and, and deconstructing this uh, in terms of what we can pretty well demonstrate uh, where these ideas come from. So I'll leave it to Jonathan M.S. Pierce to tackle the uh, philosophical yeah. uh, nature of all this, but I... I I prefer to stick with the uh, cultural, historical, and uh, history of religions approach. Thank you, Mr. Monster. Appreciate that. And Derek Sanders says, thoughts on Jesus as a magic mushroom? I don't have any. That's, <laughs> that's as I understand it, that's kind of a far-fetched uh, sort of fringe theory. And But, but to be honest, I haven't looked into it much. Um, so, you know, could be something to that. I'm not saying I know for certain it's not. I hate to dismiss something when I don't know a great deal about it. But frankly, I, I don't usually dig into something unless I'm pretty certain that there is some real meat there. Um, yeah. So obviously John M. Allegro, and then there are others who have kind of tried to go in the vein similarly, that there's like a psychedelic experience that Jesus is some type of hallucinatory experience. Um, Maybe even through the communal mill, you experience the Christ by ingesting the Christ. And of course, this is how they kind of draw these connections. I'm not convinced, but I'm also not someone who can really evaluate the works of Allegro and the languages he's reading to come into this. I, I just have no way of assessing it. I'm relying on other scholars who are more contemporaneous and the consensus on it. And the way that they said he read the Dead Sea Scrolls, as John Collins, John J. Collins has a book actually on Audible you can get right now and listen to it. He explains the history of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and Allegra plays a role in that. He gives a brief window of describing it and pretty much why scholars thought he went off the deep end in, in mm -hmm. terms of his, um, uh, of his conclusions of trying to assess and connecting Jesus with this and stuff. But um, – you know, I, I felt like it was a pretty fair uh, critique, but at the same time, Allegra was far smarter than me. So who's to know if he's on to something that I just don't, and we don't have the best evidence in the world. So I'm always open-minded if there's any new evidence we can get to glean. So there's my two cents, Derek. I had to throw them in there because I've looked into this a little myself. Ha Hammond says, happy birthday, Derek. Derekus. Derekus Sippy. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> He's really, in, really insistent about this, isn't it? Uh, yeah. I'll double check my baby. Maybe it's December 6th. It's five, maybe. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. I always thought it was November 10th. Who am I? Right. Thank you, Hammond. I appreciate the uh, happy birthday again. Uh, Derek Sanders, taking DMT makes people not fear death. Kaikeon, I'm not sure if I pronounced that properly. 
Um, I hear that that can, um, psychedelics can, generally speaking, you can have experiences that definitely alleviate the anxiety. People were cancer patients dying and stuff. They're like experimenting with this stuff and showing that, yeah, it can work for sure. Have you, uh, any thoughts on this there? Not really. I, I've never done DMT. I think the mo I've done mushrooms, and it only had a slight effect on me, but not a very profound one. Mm. So uh, I, I uh, unfortunately cannot speak intelligently about that. I understand. Well, I'd rather someone say they don't know than pretend they do. DMT I've never done, and honestly, I probably should have said just psychedelics in general, like whatever the substance may be. Um, but DMT is strong and it hits from what I understand, like intensely. So I don't know. And I would go to the experts on that to try and figure it out, but I could imagine it could Mr. Monster. Thank you again. Did you hear that? Many people are saying that can hear the sound of fallen angels screaming from hell in the dry riverbeds of the Euphrates. I hadn't heard this. Um, I sometimes hear it myself after my first coffee in the toilet in the mornings. Uh, but, but this I hadn't, I had not heard. No, no, I, I hadn't, but I've heard me some screaming angels by God, screaming demons, whatever you want to call it. Right. By people. I mean like seven, he said, so I haven't heard this, but <laughs> <laughs> look, there's people People are people, you know, people are people. Mr. Monster, I love you. I really appreciate you in the chat. And, and I always love your positive, optimistic outlook. I see you uh, even on Facebook, but of course in the chat on the, on the channels, keep that positive uh, mindset and um, don't, don't let anyone take that away from you. Mini, thank you for the money, mini, forgive me. Any holiday ham cooking recipe? Um, I, the extent of my cooking skills are, um, microwaving some taquitos or maybe putting a pizza in the oven. Uh, that's about it. I don't cook. I don't cook. I can make, I can make eggs for breakfast. Uh, my, uh, my, <laughs> my, my, my teensy adorable cutesy little ex-girlfriend taught me how to, how to make eggs. So uh, I know how to do that, but not much else. I honestly don't know. I just, I have no idea. I, my wife does most of that kind of cooking. Yes, I, I cook eggs in the morning. I cook breakfast for all of us, but I definitely lose it when it comes to the deep recipes. My mother wasn't big into cooking, so I just, I never really picked it up. It just never mm. happened. Yeah. Thank you for that support. We got a big one here. Thank you so much for the support and helping Neil Gnostic Informant. I appreciate the support. I missed the presentation. After listening to Litless Course, my question is, these mysteries don't seem super complicated or deep. After the initiations and secrecy, you would think there would be more to it. Do you all think we're missing a lot of info? Well, surely we're missing a lot of info. I mean, as their namesake suggests, these were mysteries. These were uh, secrets. The word mystery actually comes from the Greek, uh, I think it's myin, which means to, to close the eyes or the lips in secrecy. Uh, that's the actual etymology of the very word mystery. Um, so there's so much that we don't know and and had they not had that kind of secretive orientation uh you know we we'd surely know much more but um i i dare say you know given its its popularity throughout the mediterranean world and the profound impact it was having on people and their assurances of of living a new life and and having the guarantee of a blessed uh life after this one um i i dare say there probably was something very profound and and depthful depth <laughs> depthful right. about these mysteries 
I only wish we knew more. I'm with you. I, I mean, looking at the practicality of some people's lives, right? Origin goes so far as to become a eunuch. He cuts off. It's not like just circumcision. This is the, this is a whole nother level. He took it so serious that he actually went that far and he regretted it later, I guess, is supposedly what people tell me. But in, and then look at the Addis cult, right? Mysteries of Addis. I mean, people are going so far to cut the whole thing off, right? And uh, I don't know why I'm infatuated right now with that part of the body, but it seems like I guess it's because that's such a valuable part of my body that I'm like, whoever's crazy enough to do that has to be, there's got to be something about it that hook, line, and sinker grabs everything about them that they're willing to cut the whole thing off. And I mentioned this earlier that I wonder if this is, I mentioned this this morning, actually, on David McDonald's channel, Deeper Deep Drinks or something, where I was like, when Paul tells them in Galatia, which is near the place where Addis Colts would have been, when he says to go and cut the whole thing off, it could just mean, you know, hey, they're circumcised and have them slip and just, just go ahead and get rid of the whole pecker. But I thought this might be a like a pun on Addis saying, go ahead and cut the whole thing off because these Gentiles would have understood this. So I don't know, but anyone who's going that far, they have to somehow, at least it may be a subjective. They are moved. (laughs) They're moved. Yeah. Yeah. So you may not be moved. You might go and see, you might see some particular mystery religion and go, you know, I don't care for the backstory to this one. I'm not, because they all have foundation myths and you might not be a fan of the foundation myth of that one or whatever. And the practice doesn't really appeal to me, but the one that's at night that they're all in hooded cloaks with their candle lights lit and they go into the dark room and you find out about the mysteries of the ancient past. You look up at the stars and you start thinking those are gods. Not like we do today where we know that these are like gas balls of light. Like these are gods in the heavens and you're like, you could get, you know, maybe sucked into that. And then there you are in a mystery thinking this is everything. I don't know. But I had to, I had to give my thoughts because that's a really good question. And thank you mm-hmm. for checking out the presentation by Litwa because he's only scratching the surface. That might be why you didn't feel too much depth is when we went to edit that thing, just so you know, there was like 80 or 90 PowerPoints to each um, course, but we would have never been able to get through it. The amount of time he had with recording that course, he did that at, at my house. He had like a whole, bu- a whole bunch more PowerPoints to get into. We just didn't have the time. And so there's a lot more to the mystery cults that he had. And I imagine there's a lot we don't have that really was there. Any words from you on that, Derek? Or are you good on that? Um, no, I think I've pretty well, uh, responded to this one. I really appreciate you contextual religion. That really means a lot. And I'm sure that Neil will really appreciate that as well. Let's get to our mm-hmm. outro here. And, um, I've got to let you go here in just a moment, Derek, but I want people to subscribe Enter the mysteries of atheologica. How about that? You can do it for free. You don't have to cut the whole thing off. Okay. I mean, we're not encouraging that. In fact, we would hope that you, you know, keep your body parts on, okay? Enjoy them, actually. Uh, Go subscribe to Atheologica. Help him out. Derek Bennett is working hard to educate and, of course, trying to do this full time like me and Neil do. So he's slowly working his way into the field, and I'm hoping more people will go support him. One way you can do that if you can't afford anything is hitting the subscribe button and the bell and going and watching. Even if you're like, man, I don't have the time to watch this, turn your phone on, hit play or on your computer, hit the mute button so you can't hear anything, walk away. Let your computer read it. Let the algorithm read it. He gets the watch time. The algorithm sees it. Hit the like button. Drop a comment. This is free, right? The other way is he has a Patreon. You could support him on Patreon. And you said any amount enters the door? Any amount enters the door. Give me as 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 much or as little as you can i just appreciate anything that anyone is willing to contribute i'm trying i'm working my buns off Mm -hmm. uh trying to to produce as much content as i can while also 
holding down a day job. And, uh, but my dream is to be able to commit to this full time and anything that anyone has to contribute, uh, will, will, will certainly be appreciated in, uh, in, in, in getting me there. I am a patron of Derek's and these presentations that you saw, if you want access to those PowerPoints and the notes to those, they are there for those who are patrons to download and use and feel free to, you know, learn from them or even use them to engage and stuff. And so help out, help out in any way you can. And of course, our dear friend and the host of this channel, Neil Gnostic Informant, join his Patreon. I know for a fact, me and have had talks, he plans on rolling out new material, doing new things for 2023. So you can go help out Derek at any cost. I mean, like how many people drink a Starbucks of coffee, like at least once or twice a week, right? For like a dollar or $2, you'd have access the whole month with Derek. So help him out. Uh, especially for such great information and to bring more kinds of information like that and the academics and scholarship and your YouTube videos, et cetera, et cetera. So get part of his community, go show him some love. Let him know too. If you join, Hey, I came over from Gnostic informant. I came over from myth vision and that way Derek knows that he can't hate us. Cause if he tries to you know what I'm saying? Um, <laughs> I love you, Derek. I really do. I love Neil. I hope he gets feeling better. Oh, we got a we got a super chat. We got a last minute one here popping in the door. Hey, at least he's not going to get you know stuck in the lake of fire for this. Thoughts on Knights Templar connection to Oak Island? Um, I the I know nothing about this, so I I dare not comment. But I will say that there are. Um... Well, I mean, the Knights Templar were uh, a medieval thing, but um, there are modern day mystery religions. I think Christianity is a fine example of one, but also the, uh, the, the Freemasons. I mean, if you mention the Knights Templar, so you probably have an interest in Freemasonry and Freemasonry is a modern mystery religion. Um, at the, uh, during the, initiation the initiation rite involves a sort of mock death and rebirth um in in correlation with what had happened to hiram abiff <clears throat> so as a uh, hiram abiff had died the initiate is is um undergoes a ritual in which they too die and are, and are essentially reborn. Uh, but this is a, a secret known only known only to initiates. So Freemasonry is an example of a modern day mystery religion. I would say Scientology falls in there as well, only until you've reached the uh, upper echelons of uh, your you know, association with the cult, do you find the the inner secret, which is remarkably stupid, <laughs> about Lord Xenu and his uh, galactic shenanigans? So, the some of these mystery religions, um, fraternities and sororities have, I believe, their origins in mm -hmm. the the kind of um, secrecy and initiation rites of of the mysteries so we still have things uh in existence today that are very much indebted to these ancient clandestine cults thank you so much for the response there um i gotta give a shout out noni saying my hair is mirac is a miracle back to the beginning of the show derek as we're exiting this joker i mean you know, you just got the haircut, right? I did too, but I didn't brag about it. And then I got the freaking what? You told <laughs> me. <laughs> he told me. He said he told me. He said I told you. I mean, you you want to argue with him, bro? Like, what's up, man? <laughs> no, it's because no, I will not because it's the little ones that you got to worry about. This is true. He's a this firecracker. Is... I can tell. There, no, your hair is sharp, dude. For real. I'm just teasing you. Um, seriously, bro, you blow me away every time. And I'm so impressed with what you've gained and learned over the years. And um, 
I'm hoping to learn what you've learned on these subjects so that I can, you know, be able to just kind of go right into my mind and access it real simply. I'm like really focused on other things, but I'd like to get into the area and read all the scholarship that you have. Can't wait to have you back on Gnostic and Foreman. Of course, I know Nil, but of course, Myth Vision as well. And um, I hope you enjoy the holidays, brother. You as well. Uh, Merry Christmas or happy holidays, whatever you enjoy hearing to all of you. And uh, Derek, I love you, brother, as well. And Neil, hang in there. Yeah. Get well soon, brother. Let us know if you need anything else, okay? We're here for you. Yeah, that's why we did this. So we got your back, brother. Uh, we won't tell anyone the secrets of our mystery cult. But, um, you know, just so everybody knows, you have attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over you. 